Thank you very much for your introduction and good, uh, good morning, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Garcia Chambers, and um, I will be presenting on the topic of everyday aesthetics and mono no aware. Uh, by the way, this is my first such presentation outside of Japan, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, some kind of uh, critique so I can improve my research as I go along. Um, in a very strange way, I would like to begin from the very uh, end of my conclusion, because I think my, my examples are very uh, important in what I would like to say. So, um, and I just thought about it just now, to, to, to start from the very um, end of my presentation. So, if you have a copy of the uh, slide, the handout here, then you look at the very uh, end of the presentation you'll see this quotation, which uh, looks at, uh, well, it reads, uh, it is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue, and so to make a few objects beautiful, but it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and the medium through which we look, which morally we can do, to affect the quality of the day that is the highest of arts. And the key point about this presentation is all about um, you know, affecting or uh, what is the atmosphere is like and how this can uh, influence us uh, morally and make our everyday mundane, uh, sometimes boring experience more uh, pleasing, more meaningful. Um, so, beginning from the end, uh, the application of everyday aesthetics, I would like to uh, demonstrate or show you an example of how I try to apply this theory of aesthetic experience using an everyday mundane activity like taking a bath. And this is a slide, one slide from a presentation I did, I think, two years ago in Fukuoka, Japan, um, uh, looking at public communal bath from an aesthetic field to uh, aesthetic experience. And uh, uh, this theory I, I applied was uh, uh, formulated by Arnold Berlian, who is a philosopher of um, aesthetics, uh, an American philosopher, and I'm closely uh, following his work, as well as another philosopher who is also a colleague of his, Yuliko Saito, which I'll talk about uh, later on. But when I did this um, presentation, I tried to show how um, taking a bath can be an aesthetic experience, and I uh, used the, uh, the strategy, or I would say uh, this uh, approach by Arnold Berlian, where he looks at the, where basically uh, aesthetics experience uh, is not only about going to the museum or looking at art in, in, in an institutionalized way, but life itself can be aesthetic based on our um, approach to it. And so um, he used the concept of the aesthetic field and so when I did this presentation, I, I tried to apply it to taking a bath and the fact that um, it, it is about certain uh, processes of, you know, if you, if you have ever experienced taking a bath in a, in a public setting, in Japan you call it a uh, sento or super sento public bath, or if you go to the onsen, which is a more natural setting usually. But it involves entering uh, bathing, noticing, uh, observing certain rules. Um, it moves from that stage to uh, the bather, you know, being absorbed into the activity of bathing and the different uh, processes or steps that uh, the bather might take uh, to the point 
where one might um, be so much involved in the act of taking a bath. The water is you know, usually very warm. There are other people there doing what they're there to do. And if you were to you know, be attentive, even to yourself, but you can't help but notice on other people, you realize that you're in a space where everybody uh, seems to be enjoying or relaxed, seem very relaxed and into what they're doing. And the total experience itself can be quite aesthetic. So um, when I did this, I, I focused a lot and explained it more, and I don't want to spend too long on it because it's just a, an example where I talked about moving from the aesthetic field to having an aesthetic transaction, then an aesthetic engagement, then you experience a certain amount of unity where the mind, body, and soul come together. And from that, you can have some sense of delight, some sense of beauty in this ordinary experience as taking a bath. Uh, it can be a, some kind of serenity or meditation. And uh, of course, it has transcendental qualities as well. This is an aesthetic ex experience. But um, more importantly, I think, is this uh, uh, three descriptive uh, points uh, written by this uh, author, uh, Bruce Smith and Yoshiko Yamamoto, talking about uh, taking a bath and what it's like in Japan. And they relate the experience of what it's like um, in the bath, uh, in the sento, and how one can have an aesthetic experience. She said, between long soaks in the hot water, I would go quietly about my business of washing my hair and body as other ladies, both younger and older, would also scrub their bodies and busy themselves. Sometimes I was right next to somebody, and other times I found myself all alone, lost in a world of my dreams. I remember suddenly coming out of my own thoughts one time to realize how everyone was scrubbing his or her body with such uh, intense seriousness, and I like that. I like all of us sharing that moment of cleansing and the sense of belonging and comfortable acceptance we had for each other without ever having to say anything about it. So this is how she relates her experience, aesthetic experience of taking a bath. She continues uh, when she says, with all of us naked and bathing together, there, is what, there was a sense that we were, after all, just humans, all trying to live as well as we could. And then finally, this one's very interesting. I remember one evening covertly watching a middle-aged woman clean and wash her face that had been covered with heavy makeup. When I finally saw her face cleaned and scrubbed, suddenly I felt like telling her that it was beautiful, that she didn't need to cover it. This for me, just reading it itself, I don't have to be there, uh, but reading it and uh, thinking about it for me is an aesthetic experience. Um, so this is the first example of, uh, I would say, an everyday aesthetics and uh, uh, one can have an aesthetic experience uh, doing some ordinary activities. Another key point and a key example that I would have talked about in my conclusion um, is taken from uh, maybe a book that is familiar to you. It was written a long, long time ago, Norway, no Mori, uh, Norwegian Woods, um, Murakami Haruki. And there's a line in it um, which I thought uh, was very, very interesting and it captures a feeling of um, or a sense or a sensibility about Japanese um, own uh, aesthetic, uh, uh, one aesthetic, I would say, quality or principle of Japan, which, which focus on feelings. And later on, when I talk about Mono no Aware, you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about here. But um, the background to it is quite um, simple, where Toru, the pro protagonist, was all um, sad and wandering in Shikoku and uh, hungry and on the ocean, uh, lying along the beach and uh, very distraught. But um, the, the, the story went like this, that a, a fisherman saw him and you know, talked to him and what's going on and gave him sake and a cigarette and he, they ate. And he, he said, what was the problem? He lied to the fisherman that his mother had died, but in, in fact his girlfriend had committed suicide. But uh, the man talked to him and he felt really good because the man was comforting him. 
But the man went away and returned the next day, and when he returned, he brought more sake and fish, uh, sake and, um, and, and sushi, and they enjoyed eating it again. But something happened when the old man, or the fisherman, was about to leave. He took 5,000 yen, 5,000 Japanese yen, from his pocket and pushed it in Tolu's pocket and says, here's some money. Go and get yourself a bath and, you know, stay in a hotel and tomorrow there's enough to go back to Tokyo. And uh, this is the scene how uh, Tolu responded to the old man, uh, the fisherman, and what the fisherman said after that. And I thought this was capture enough, uh, because part of everyday aesthetics is also about how we communicate with each other and how we think about each other's feelings, which, also, which is also part of um, Japanese uh, aesthetics that I'm looking at here. Um, he said, I said he had done more than enough for me, and I could not accept the money on top of everything else, but he refused to take it back. It's not money, he said. That's the old man said that. It's my feeling. Don't think about it too much. Just take it. All I could do was thank him and accept it. That point there, well, first point is, when it was 5,000 yen, Tolu could refuse it and say, oh, I can't accept this money. But then the old man re re responded by saying, it's not money, it's my feelings. Money became feelings. Money plus alpha, near here. And uh, Tolu says, <laughs> all I could do after hearing, because he, he, he thought, uh, being considerate, being concerned, and in that situation with the, whole, the fisherman, uh, you know, out of his, the kindness of his heart has, had helped him, all I could do was thank him and accept the money. I thought this uh, line in Murakami's book, um, apart from the tone of the book and people of all kinds of... Um, uh, views about Mur Murakami's writing and his style and everything else. I thought this, for me, was a point of aesthetic experience and understanding Japanese sense of um, aesthetics in terms of, and there's a connection to uh, uh, Mono no Hawale as well, which I'll later talk about. The third and final example, because I want to get into the examples, because examples are very, very important here. And I don't know if you know about this story, of the Watts family, where this, uh, this, uh, this took place in America in a small community where the father is alleged to have murdered his two young daughters and his pregnant wife. That's, the, um, that's alleged. And uh, there, there was this article written on, uh, published on Yahoo webpage that I thought was very, very interesting the author reacting to it and talking about um, how everything looked really rosy. And uh, this is about you know, social media and how in our everyday experience of social media, what we, the pictures we put up, the, the, the things we say, they really hide uh, you know, what's really going on in fact. And um, sometimes, because of social media, we don't get the chance to really talk to each other. And in that kind of talking to each other, sometimes people sometimes can hide uh, their true feelings or their true situations if you are talking to them through you know, social media or via social media. But if you meet more and talk to people, then um, usually the body language doesn't lie so much. And you can, you, people may, come out and say certain things. But um, the, the key point about this was the, uh, the, the article. And uh, what the author said, particularly perplexing about the Chris Watts story, is that the father appeared to be very kind. All the social media posts uh, suggest that he was a very, very good father. And the author says, how can one possibly reconcile this tragedy, this terror with the family on social feed? Uh, social feed? When I see the video of Shannon and her daughters, I smile in spite of myself. Their moments of joy feels genuine, and my response to genuine joy is empathic. Th then I think of the horror and how I can empathize with what I don't see. I think how foolish it is to pretend that the glimpses we have into home lives of others are meaningful. Pictures lie. Instagram lies. Facebook 
it goes without saying, lies. This is what the author wrote. She ended her uh, article by saying, despite our best intentions, social media has made us liars of us, uh, has made liars of us all. Not pathological liars, but circumstantial liars, conveniently avoiding the truth of our lives because it's not, it's simply not something that's done. And the most poignant of the quotes and the things she said, imagine if we were more truthful, imagine if our feeds were more social and less media. I think everyday aesthetics is all about getting us to be more concerned and more attentive to human needs in our communication. Those uh, three examples are what I would have mentioned at the end of my presentation. And so if you may go back now <laughs> to the very uh, start of my presentation, and I will uh, try to, I'll do mostly reading here of what I would like to say, but this is really uh, the theoretical background and explaining my purpose for writing this article, uh, doing this research and making this presentation. So, everyday aesthetics and mono noale, betwixt and between. Later on, I'll uh, also talk about why I have this uh, subtitle at the betwixt and between and my sense of indecisiveness about these two. But um, the appreciation to define uh, aesthetics, uh, everyday aesthetics, the appreciation of the ordinary mundane things of everyday life is an emerging area of aesthetics that has been given theoretical attention by Japanese scholar Yuriko Saito among others, both non-Western and um, Eastern philosophical traditions. With its moral and ethical bent, everyday aesthetics as an attitude and way of life that seek to bring a higher quality to our daily existence seems to find fertile ground, if not inherent to Japanese culture. That's one of my main arguments. But at the same time, inherent to Japanese aesthetic culture is a difficult to define concept, mono no aware. As a Japanese philosophical concept and poetic consciousness, I've elsewhere argued that mono no aware is an interpretation and an internalization of the inherently transient quality of life and things. For example, while there is sadness evoked in this recognition of our ephemeral existence, there's also beauty occasioned by what could sometimes be a positive sign that at least a precious thing or an experience didn't go unnoticed. In this presentation, what I'm contending is that everyday aesthetics is essentially about the recognition and expansion of this positive sigh when faced with decay, aging, sadness, tragedy, as in the case of the Watts family, transience, and uh, the tears of things, to borrow a very old Latin saying, lacrimae rerun. Moreover, this contemporary subfield of everyday aesthetics I think has an unmistakable Japanese roots, one that is fertilized, as it were, in transiency, impermanence, and connectedness. Moreover, to the extent, I think, that the characteristics of transiency, impermanence, and connectedness are driving forces of our appreciation of the ordinary, mundane, daily affairs, it shares, I think, with a, a very deep relation to mono no aware consciousness. It is the points of convergence betwixt and between these two ostensibly traditional, on the one hand, and contemporary aesthetics, concept, or sensibilities that my presentation is trying here to theorize. In doing so, I hope which I did earlier, to show examples of how an everyday aesthetic attitude and a mono no awale consciousness can symbiotically lift our quality of daily existence. Above all, Yuriko Saito's perspective on Japanese aesthetics and its moral dimension is one that I'm fully much in agreement with. She talks about cultivating moral sensibilities, for example, in respecting the innate characteristics of objects and honoring 
and responding to human needs. Now I'd like to quickly give a you know, quick review of the blossoming of everyday aesthetics because everyday aesthetics is a subfield of philosophy of aesthetics um, which came about not about three decades ago, so it's quite still in its um, infancy. Everyday aesthetics as an aesthetic, um, everyday aesthetics or the aesthetics of everyday life emerged in Western philosophical circle as a counter to and a criticism of what was hitherto an almost entire focus on fine arts as the proper subject matter of aesthetic study, theory, and experience. In addition, everyday aesthetics came into being, I'm arguing, as a response to the notion of the narrow scope of the prevailing spectator-oriented, to borrow Yulikosaito's expression, spectator-oriented aesthetics, and a need to be broadened in order to account for other sensuous experiences and sensibilities of life and living. To say this in another way, an action-oriented aesthetics, Saito among others have argued, which defies the dominating and traditional Kantian disinterested approach, has brought inclusiveness and a democratizing spirit to the study, theory, and practice of sensuous life. In this way, I think, honoring the Dewan to, uh, in terms of uh, jo uh, James John Dewey, notion that art and life are inseparable. Arnold Berlin, who I talked about earlier, was very pointed in his criticism when he argued that aesthetic experience pervades the many regions of life from practical activities devoted to food gathering, craftsmanship, to ceremonial observances and other social occasions. We must abandon the ethnocentric assumptions of most modern Western aesthetics that restrict art and the aesthetic to the careful circumscribed objects and occasion. The concept of art is more inclusive than Western aesthetics has allowed, an aesthetic experience far more pervasive. Moreover, I think aesthetic um, aesthetics, everyday aesthetics emerge as a sub-discipline of aesthetics occasioned by what is called a philosophical meeting of the East versus the West, or East and West. This may be considered a crossing of boundaries, or perhaps more correctly, a yielding of Western aesthetics to the Eastern reality that aesthetic is pervasive, touching every aspect of life. Whether this is theorized as, an, as the extraordinary in the ordinary, or simply the beauty, pleasure, gracefulness, kindness, or joy that attend to the ordinariness of our quotidian existence, or quotidian rather existence, everyday aesthetics, is a blossoming discipline emerging in Western philosophical circles, though organically rooted in Eastern holistic philosophy. So how might we account for this blossoming of everyday aesthetics? To answer this question, I turn to Berliant, Arnold Berliant again. And uh, he talked about the transformations in art and aesthetics, and where he gives a lecture, which is quite instructive, on everyday aesthetics germination. Brilliant, appropriately, I think, situates the emergence of aesthetics of the everyday as part of a new approach to aesthetics inquiry that addresses the challenges faced by theories of aesthetic experience. One central challenge of aesthetic theory has been how to account for the fact that aesthetic values belong not only to the environment of objects in traditional Western dualistic, spectator-oriented, art-based sense, but also within the situations of environment, situations that include human relationships in which active engagement can lead to aesthetic experience. It is this, in brilliant words, recognizing that the heart of aesthetic lies in sensibility, and therefore developing awareness and the capacity of aesthetic sensibility leads to immensely broader and richer social experience. Now, after pointing to its antecedents, which are environmental aesthetics and the aesthetics of nature, Brilliant cites John Dewey's art as experience as a contemporary intellectual foundation of everyday aesthetics. 
Interestingly, Liu Yuedi, if I pronounce this name correctly, and Curtis Carter, Poole Heidegger, and Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein with Dewey as the three most important philosophers who cleared the way, as it were, for everyday aesthetics blossoming. Heidegger and Wittgenstein and Dewey's main contribution is in their rejection, I think, of, in their rejection of the subject-object dichotomy in philosophy. Heidegger distinguishes between authenticity and non-authenticity in art in his calling for a return to everyday life, while Dewey seeks to find art in the stream of experience the followers of Wittgenstein prefer to understand art in terms of social institutions such as the art world. Among these three philosophers, however, Dewey's theory of consummate experience is especially useful for its relevance to everyday aesthetics, as his ideas are cited in recent research by aestheticians as offering a model for the idea of promoting artful life. How much of your time? Nineteen. Okay, I'll go for another nine or so minutes. Okay, let's see. So, um, admittedly, the pragmatic aesthetics advocated by these three giants of philosophy, that which drives everyday aesthetics while sharing common interests, differ in fundamental ways. Most noti notably, is the point that pragmatic aesthetics advocates art as experience which is everyday aesthetics, in, concerned, in contrast with experience as art. The reversal of this phrase, though seemingly simple, underscores a very important difference in direction. The idea of art as experience aims at restoring the continuity of art and everyday life, its focus being on how art is integrated into everyday experience. However, the idea of experience as art has its footing in experience, emphasizing that art is merely a part of human experience and that human experience itself possesses aesthetic qualities. This latter point is going in the direction of building a new form of living based on the aesthetics of everyday life. The contemporary blossoming of everyday aesthetics, according to Berlian, began in the 1990s with some of, um, you know, some publications, including two books in the 1990s, David Novitz, The Boundaries of Art, and Arnold Berlian's Art and Engagement. While there was a collection of published um, work titled uh, The Aesthetics of Everyday Life, it was Katia Mandoki's Everyday Aesthetics which published in 2007, that addresses the topic pointedly and extensively. That same year, the publication of Unico Saito's Everyday Aesthetics propels the sub this subdiscipline to a level of wide-scale recognition. Thomas Ledy's The Extraordinary in the Ordinary, The Aesthetics of Everyday Life, published 2012, Aesthetics of Everyday Life, East and West, edited by UAD and Curtis Carter in 2014, and Yuriko Saito's Aesthetics of the Familiar, Everyday Life and World Making, published just last year, 2017, round off the major volumes expanding this study of aesthetic appreciation and, in effect, rejecting strongly, I'm arguing, the traditional separation of art from life activities in the conviction that the scope of the arts has no limit. Now I would quickly want to make a connection between everyday aesthetics and uh, mono no aware and how the two, I think, are really uh, intertwined, or the point of convergence, which I think uh, occurs between the two. And Yuriko Saito's uh, summarizing her, her, her thought um, leads me into that, if I can quickly go to that. But uh, for Yuriko Saito, an everyday aesthetics attitude that leads to having an aesthetic experience can be extraordinary and intense at times. However, she's saying that sometimes it may be a negative experience in the classific classificatory sense, which can trigger action pragmatically and mentally into changing and removing or fixing the source of such negative experience. 
The defining characteristic of everyday aesthetic attitude and experience is, according to Ms. Saito, being mindful um, or having mindful attention, perceptual engagement, and employment of the sensibility to everyday life. My own view, which is one of the main arguments of this presentation, is that mindful attention, perceptual engagement, and the employment of sensibility toward everyday life is inherent to Japanese cultural tradition and remains integral to its contemporary realities. <coughs> Focusing on topics such as the appreciation of the quintessential characteristics of objects, appreciation of packaging and the use of natural materials, Japanese aesthetics appreciation of ambience, Japanese food and its appreciation of seasonableness, among others, Yuriko Saito, I think, shows that aesthetic sensibilities are so interwoven into her native Japanese culture and tradition, making everyday aesthetic discussion and theories in Japan hitherto unnecessary. However, among the topics that Saito discussed in her books that are directly related to the theme of my effort are the idea of transience in Japanese poetic and cultural life and the aestheticization of transience. Saito notes authoritatively, in Japanese uh, tradition, aesthetic pleasure in age objects is also derived from the analogy between our transience and the notion of impermanence triggering, uh, triggered by aging. A major theme of Japanese aesthetics originated in the Asian court poetry, lamentation over aristocrats passing youth, beauty, love affairs, power, and the wealth was invariably expressed by reference to evanescence phenomena of nature, passing of season, rain, mist, snow, changing colors of leaves, and the falling cherry blossoms. And this is allied to the uh, mono, uh, get, uh, Genji no Monogatari. Um, everyday aesthetics and mono no awale, betwixt and between. I think numerous scholars have focused on what is uh, mono no aware and its connection to um, Notori Molinaga, Motori Nolinaga, and how his motive was political in trying to promote uh, Japanese uh, uh, native uh, or difference between Japanese approach to aesthetics and uh, Confucian values that were, had imported from China. And, uh, but there are many other works that have been uh, produced and many research uh, on Mono Awale, which I won't get into right here. But just to define Mono Awale, myself, I, did a present, I, did, I wrote an article on that um, way back in 2012. And that was in reaction to uh, which I thought that the 2011 triple disaster in Japan, whereas in Japan um, there's a tendency to have a, you know, a kind of they call it omoyali, uh, considerateness to think about others. And if, when it's time of tragedy, people tend to do, uh, to tone down celebration. But I argued um, in that paper, and this was my first paper in aesthetics, so to speak, was that um, mono no aware and uh, hanami, hanami I think, the deep meaning of hanami is mono no aware. And it's about observance of the transient quality of life. But there's also a celebratory aspect of mono no aware. But I, I mentioned in that article that 2011, was a mono no awalesque moment. It was the perfect time to think about life and its ephemerality and to think about how we bond with each other and how we communicate and attend to the needs of others. And uh, I, I, I would have certainly a lot more to say. Uh, there are other definitions of mono no awale which goes on and on. And there's a point that uh, I don't want to seem as if I'm essentializing that um, transience and the whole concept of transience is totally an Eastern uh, concept because way back in 19, well, not long ago, Sigmund Freud wrote a f uh, famous, uh, well, it's not so famous, but a very interesting essay on transience, which he's talking about the fact that he was walking in the garden with a friend and look at the, he was saying, look at these flowers that they look so beautiful, but in no time they will, you know, wither and, and go. But, and he t talked and said, uh, well, this is all the reason that we should celebrate it, the fact that it will not be here soon. So, and then, uh, mono no awale, we may have a sense that 
it's totally, a, only Japanese can feel or experience Mono no Awale. And uh, Donald Ritchie, in, in a very interesting uh, essay, mentioned this point. Uh, we can all experience Awale. All of us do not seek to define it, but Japan does. And I think, uh, to that extent, the concept of everyday aesthetics, it's, it's born in the Western uh, philosophical aesthetic tradition, but, but at the same time, it was inherently rooted in, in Japanese tradition. So I think it, it shows that there's a, it's, it's all about humanity, the, the bottom line. And I'm not arguing that uh, Mono no Awale is essentially about Japanese aesthetics feelings. Uh, it's just a matter of definition here. I think um, that's enough <laughs> in terms of allowing time to, to answer any questions you may have. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, presentation. We have about um, eight minutes for questions and comments. I, I, don't, I don't want to start, but um, well, um, uh, that's why I talk about the press of the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes. Um, I had some problems from the so-called Western point of view. Yes. They don't like this um, dualism at all. And but you brought it up. So um, um, you talked about a problem uh, uh, Kant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Kant. In Kant, we, we have something called just doesn't trust. This is yes, the yes. Idea mm -hmm. of so um, yeah, it's, it's from the. Spectator, uh -huh. but um, and this this is something um, um, after Kant there formed something mm. what is called the romantic aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, we have the idea of Kant uh, uh, taken into into the real life. So um, the romantic is always uh, looked from the outside. The German romantic is looked like like some uh, beautiful pictures with flowers and nymphs and so on. Mm -hmm. But there is a strong theories um, Platano, Tieck. Schlegel, um, Hölderlin. Yes. So, and um, this is, uh, these everyday aesthetics mm -hmm. in the Romantic is pretty important in the 19th century before the psychological aesthetic came up. Okay. And this is, uh, Nietzsche is influenced by it. Ne yes, yes, that's uh, good. Heidegger is influenced by it, um, you, you mentioned. Um, uh, uh, Jaspers, some, uh, 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 swept over to, to, to life philosophy, to, to, uh, step over to Platano, uh, step, uh, step over to, um, I forgot the name at this moment, I have some names in mind, um, even to Bexon. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, huge uh, impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, prop so we, we have this kind of idea of this everyday life, uh, everyday uh, experience <coughs> um, uh, as, as an active part of uh, um, uh, participation in the life world. So, both of have these ideas too. And the down point, let's see the first point, the, the, the second point is more down point. Yes. Uh, because uh, I have always some kind of belly pain uh, when, when, uh, when Heidegger is mentioned as one of uh, the great ones. Um, even in Heidegger we have some problems um, uh, goes further to what we have later uh, mm. in the aesthetic of the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. and the aesthetic uh, in, 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 in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So that the um, aesthetic uh, perception mm -hmm. is much more important than social life. We have these kind of uh, sub, uh, sub, sub, uh, subjective life mm -hmm. subordinated yeah. under this uh, everyday life aesthetic. There's danger in this. Mm -hmm. too. That's a problem uh, uh, after the uh, uh, Second World War in Germany, especially mm -hmm. how to define aesthetics. The Frankfurt School, and so uh, to, to, to be careful with this kind. Okay, so thank we you. had this, and we had a lot of problems with this. Um, so uh, this, from the Western point of view, that is much more complicated than you presented it in my um, point of view. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I, I take your So maybe you can merge this together in, yeah. Yes, thank, thank you. you yeah, good, good, thank you. 
<laughs> Any other question? Or? Uh, I have a question. Yes, thank you very much for uh, your wonderful presentation. I'm sorry. Yeah. Excuse me for my heart. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. So I have um, one question and one remark or mm. uh, thinkable question. Mm -hmm. So the first is um, in your slide from uh, Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, if I understand it quite well, uh, you mean that the experience as art is variable versus art as experience. Mm -hmm. and, it is, and my question is, is the thinking idea in one direction or it um, depends each other? Uh, because if it do not depend each other, I would like to say it's not really Asian, Asian or Japanese thinking. Because uh, if I the experience of art, it always um, influence my um, my my kind or my mm -hmm. way how uh, I take awareness of the world and of my inner world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if I, my inner world creates itself new mm -hmm. uh, moment, in the next moment I, be, I see the outside world uh, in a new um, bright or in, in a new view. Yeah. So, and it is a, a dualism, it is a dialectic yeah. way. So the influence from the outside experience and my inner experience, mm -hmm. it depends each other. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Berlin would, would agree with you. Uh, basically, he was, his point was about a balance of, you know, uh, the Western uh, tradition has been very restrictive. So everyday aesthetics is broadening the scope and to say that um, experience itself is art and uh, is the, the gap between high culture and low culture, everything is seeing we are all humans and um, we, we have experience and to that extent uh, we can have aesthetic. It's all about our attentive engagement to some kind of activity. Just about anything can be aesthetic. I, I, I remember um, just taking the train in Japan and one day I was on the platform which is an ordinary experience and saw a lady reading a novel. I think it was a novel, reading a book. I don't know what it was. But the lady was crying. And for me, that, uh, w w uh, seeing her reading and, and tears coming down her eyes, that, that ordinary, that for me was, was aesthetic. And, but it's based on my being attentive to it. That, that, for me, that was as artistic. It, 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 it was you know, sharing something with me, and I, I felt a kind of... A common point with her, and for me, I think that's that aesthetic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how to uh, speak, or my, my big question is how we can uh, speak from Asian or Japanese aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's not, uh, it's not really aesthetics because if we go back to the roots of the term aesthetics, mm -hmm. there we can. Person. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the Western um, expression of aesthetics, mm -hmm. it is a completely other stuff, mm -hmm. I would like to say. For that, I have really a problem if we speak from uh, East Asian aesthetics or uh, Japanese aesthetics. Yeah. It's not really aesthetics, it is something other. It is maybe really just awareness of the uh, beauty. Also, this is good, so I'm sorry. Oh, uh, the, the definition of dilemma, okay. Yes, yes, you, can you take um, that now? Yes, to try to keep it very, very short. We only have one minute. Maybe a comment, if you <laughs> wish. To what, well, I've got one question. To what extent do you see Manana Awale still being distinctively Japanese, or to what extent could it be, is it a kind of distinct uh, one? I don't think it's, I don't think it's distinctly Japanese. Uh, 
authoritarianism because it emphasizes how unique it brings to the day to day as opposed to a kind of stamped order. But it's bearing in mind the Japanese nationalists took a lot from Confucianism, much more so than Motoi uh, uh, no Nanaga did. Uh -huh. Although he, he was critical to the Chinese, I wouldn't call him a nationalist. But anyway, I'm sorry, I can't Thank you. <laughs> If you have a quick, uh, no, no, I, I, I totally agree with, with his point. And, okay, um, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. When the, we can talk uh, more about <laughs> it. Yes. Okay, um, I know that there was another question, but mm. okay, I, mean, I think, yeah, we'll mm. put that for the conference. Okay, uh, thank you again. Thanks, thanks. The, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.